Hello and welcome to another episode of Help Me Buy Property Podcast. Today we are going to talk about retirement and SMSF investing. And so when you talk about retirements, retirements is a never-ending vacation technically, right? And so it is the only time in life where time should no longer be equal to money. And so we are going to talk about superannuations and self-managed superannuations. And uh, how does property comes into place when you talk about super innovation? <laughs> I'll introduce my guest today, my co-host Sohail, who is the tax director of Tax Visors, who is as a tax director of Investor Partner Group. Welcome, Sohail, to the podcast. Hi, hi, Moss. Thanks for having me here. How's your day been so far? All good, yeah. You know, uh, in the accounting industry, we're always busy. Uh, it's never ending. There's something to do every time. Definitely, definitely. And so we are talking about retirements. And so uh, people's mentality, if you go back 10, 20, 30 years, was that, you know, people want to die rich. And I always <laughs> say that you want to live rich rather than die rich, right? Mm. Uh, live your life to the fullest. And so, a lot of people, when they think about retirement, it's a point in time. It's a day in the future when they'll turn 60, uh, they'll go cold turkey, wake up one day, and boom, they're retired, right? Mm. And, and we have talked about this in the past, and we say, well, retirement is truly a transition. It's a transition from choosing, you know, working four days a week instead of five days a week. It's, it's choosing what you love to do most. It's choosing what you love to do most till you drop, drop dead. Mm. And so we are going to talk about property investing and self-managed supers and how does that fit into all of this. I want to mm. very quickly call out the caveat that this should not be constituted as any financial advice, any super innovation advice, any SMSF advice, any financial planning advice. And so reach out to your accountants, reach out to your financial advisors, financial planners uh, to get very specific advice in relation to what your case scenarios are. What we would be discussing today here would be very, very generic in nature. And some of the strategies that we're talking about when we talk about property and SMSF or self-managed super fund. So having said that, Sohel, talk to us, what is self-managed super fund? Okay, yeah. So it's a good thing to uh, about the disclaimer. That it's definitely not a financial planning advice. Everyone should go back to the respective professionals for their personal advice. Okay, okay self-managed super fund. As you know, superannuation is a it's a retirement saving scheme in Australia, which is compulsory. It was introduced in nineteen nineteen eighty five, I think. Okay, and since then it was compulsory for all the employees to put some money aside for retirements for their employees, and uh, after they retire, they can access that money. It is a self managed super fund is the same thing. You, you are saving for your retirement, and employees are required to contribute some money compulsory mandated percentage into super super energy scheme for your retirement. Self-managed means that now you have the flexibility to manage that money yourself instead of giving it to your financial advisor or managed investment scheme or managed funds, you manage your funds yourself. So uh, to to it gives you more it it, it is it is more flexible vehicle uh, for your retirement savings. Um, it, how you invest, where you invest, you get some more options there. So that's what self-managed super fund. And so, and what's the process of setting this up? So if someone wants to set up a self-managed super fund, we'll use SMSF because it's just easier and quicker to say it. What's the process of setting this up when you're setting up SMSF and what fees is associated with setups and ongoing management? Because that's a big question that everyone asks. Yeah, that's true because uh, lots of people think that it's, it is uh, it is an expensive exercise to set up a self-managed super fund and to manage it. it, it the short answer is it is it is it, it is subjective. Uh, if you ask ASIC, they will say you yeah, don't start your SMSF until you have um, five hundred thousand in your um, um, retirement savings. Yes. Um, if you have a decent amount in your super, you can start your self-managed super fund. Even you can start with one dollar; doesn't really matter. But you should be getting that financial advice whether it is suitable for you or not. That's a different thing. If you decide and you you got an answer from your financial advice that yeah, you should explore the SMSF or self-managed super fund, 
the cost of establishing super funds it sits around fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. Okay, that's the initial cost, and that cost be reimbursed by self managed super fund once the money is available in the super fund. Once the super fund is established, it's it's like a, a, a business structure like you have family trust, but different kind of very regulated family trust or a trust. You you establish there are some documentation to be done. Once your documentations are prepared, signed, executed, uh, you get an ABN for your super fund, open a bank account, and roll over from your retail super into your self managed super fund. Every year, you need to get your financial statements and audit done for your super fund. Okay, so that's an ongoing cost cost every year. Usually, it depends on the complexity. If if it is an accumulation mode with the Simple investment, couple of bank accounts, then it cost, would cost you around twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a year, including audits. If you have uh, different diversified investment in there with shareholdings and investment properties, then it could cost a little bit more than that. But usually, it is not that maximum. I have seen around five thousand dollars a year for for a super fund, um, sure. which more than um, um, two million dollars in the balance in there. So. Uh, yeah, the balance grow, but the cost does not go up with the balance. Uh, yes. In contrast, you can see that in the retail super fund, the balance go up because it is tied up with the percentage of management fee and advisor fee. It goes up with the balance go when the balance go up in the in the retail yes. super fund. Yeah. And so a lot of people, when you talk to them, of course, it's the entry fees that people care True. about a lot more, and that's what painful, you know, cost that comes in at the very start. But what a lot of people don't realize that that fees can be covered by their superannuation itself. It's not an out-of-pocket expense or a cash flow expense to a lot of people. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, they can get that um, um, money because that's the cost of the super fund anyway. So, which is, yeah, you can get it reimbursed from your self-managed super fund. Yes. Perfect. And so we've talked about Bayer Trust and how Bayer Trust comes into a lot of these pictures, especially when you're thinking about putting properties into SMSF. And so talk to us a bit of the complications around Bay Trust. When does it need to be set up? Who does it need to be set up for? There's a bit yeah. of cost involved in setting up Bay Trust. Yeah. Let's uh, get a bit of an understanding there. Yeah, before we go into Bay Trust details, it is, it is understand, we need to understand that self managed fund, when they initially uh, legislated in Australia, the, you were not allowed to borrow in self managed super fund. Okay? Then in 2007, uh, the Labour government changed this in the law and you could then self managed super fund were, was allowed to t- get uh, loans or from the uh, from the lenders or from the banks so that then the bear trust concept was uh, I- initiated at the time the super fund can borrow money from the banks but when the, uh, the, the because the legislation is designed in a manner that you need to have a separate trust to hold the property while having the loan separately in the self managed super fund to protect the self interest of the members of the self managed super fund. So that's the main idea. So what Bay Trust do? It's a very basic trust which holds the property while it is mortgaged to the lender for the money they they have given to the self managed super fund. So the idea behind Bay Trust is that the lender is not gonna touch any other asset in the self managed super fund. They are limited to that particular property they are mortgaging for the loans. So, Bay Trust comes into action when self managed super fund needs to borrow uh, some money for for the property. When you buy property on cash, there is no Bay Trust needed as such anyway. So, sure. Yeah. Sure. And so, if you talk more about property and SMSF, uh, a lot of the questions that people tend to ask is, what is the minimum amount? Of course, you can set up an SMSF for even a dollar. You know, That's if, true, if yeah. it suits you. What is the bare minimum amount that we should consider when we are thinking about buying a property in SMSF, for example? I mean, it, it, it really depends. I mean, if you ask ASIC, uh, they'll say, don't put your money in self managed super until you have half a million in your super. Okay. Initial advice about five years ago, they said, if you have 100,000, you could in, start your SMSF, no problem. Then they changed the advice to 250. Now they have removed that advice altogether. I so said, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. Okay. But don't make any mistakes when you buy, M- making sure that whatever you invest in, it's you do proper due diligence and do a, get a, a proper advice from financial planners. So 100%. there's no, 
I would say at least two hundred and fifty thousand. That's my personal opinion, though. No? That if you have at least two hundred and fifty thousand, then it's it's cost effective at the same time, and you have enough as a deposit to buy a property. If you are going towards that advice to buy a property in Salman Super Fund, if you want to invest in shares only, say it, you can start with one hundred fifty thousand as well. It is important to understand regulatory bodies. They want you to make sure that you invest in diversified in environment. Okay, you just don't invest. All your money in one investment, okay? Though they allow you to invest in one, they, 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 there's no you, nobody is stopping you to invest in any particular invest uh, in particular asset class if you like. But you have to make sure that you have done your due diligence on that. So you, for property, yes, you can start with 150,000. I think it should be minimum 250,000 dollars, which makes makes sense in terms of cost and. And uh, the deposit side of things as well. And it's you it's important to understand that even from a bank's perspective, you know there would be money required to borrow, That's which true. is usually around twenty percent deposit of whatever the quality asset that you want to buy, and you want to buy a good quality asset in superannuation or SMSF fund. Uh, but what's also important is that the bank would leave some liquidity back, you know, between five percent to ten percent, depending on who the borrower is, who the lender is in the fund, and so you combine the two together. You know, two hundred thousand dollars up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars seems like a realistically good amount, where you're leaving a bit of liquid cash within SMSF while you're using a portion of that money towards buying a property. The other important point that you make, which is is quite important, is from an asset perspective, superannuation is not there for you to gamble. It's not there That's for true, you yes. to, you know, play around. A lot of people naturally think that you know, oh, it's because it's not impacting my lifestyle right now. Or I'm not sacrificing my lifestyle. I can make risky choices in SMSF. Well, mm. yes, you can, and no, you should not, because mm. you can, because you are just because you have a free hand to make those choices. You should not, because ultimately this is your retirement fund, and so you know making any errors in superannuation could be very detrimental on having a really poor That's retirement. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it's it's a very important, and so let's talk about the type of properties first in super, and so. I see a lot of uh, property or sales agents, you know, pushing for house and land packages or mm. pushing for off the plan properties. And these days, they have become sort of quite tech savvy, or should I say, quite sort of technical. And they'll mm. say, "Oh, fully paid, fully built house and land package." So, you know, we know that you know you can't do construction in SMSF, but they'll do a single line contract these days with Super, such that you know you can actually start buying some of these finished products in in Super as well now. And so. It it comes down to that, okay, why as buyers agents or as property advisors, we always force people or always advise people, not force people to go for established properties because growth is a lot more important when it comes to properties within SMSF than yields. Of course, yields are important. Don't get me wrong, that yield is not important at all because the rates attracted by SMSF are quite substantially higher than what you would pay a normal mortgage in a normal environment. Uh, but the growth is what's going to basically put your portfolio on steroids. Um, I always say this, that the the rent that you're going to get, or the yield that you're going to get is enough to get the income going and you know the normal management of the SMSF. But the growth is what's going to get you out of the rat race, especially when it comes from the retirement perspective. That's true. I mean, growth is really important in, within the self-managed environment. Especially when you transition from your accumulation mode to your pension mode, your growth is going to support you in your retirement life, basically. And that growth is tax-free after you retire. So it becomes a good tax-effective vehicle at the same time in later stage of your life. Definitely. And so one question that I'm always asked is that, okay, if I have 400000 or $500,000 cash, in my SMSF, why should I use the debt in the first place? Especially, you know, if you're using SMSF, why shouldn't I just buy the property outright, right? You know, technically, you can go out there and yeah. buy a property for three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars, uh, which is generating say six percent yield or seven percent yield, and that would be enough to cater for it. And so, why shouldn't you just go out there and buy something in cash? And so, the two questions that are quite sort of important is why property. And we'll talk about some of those scenario testings because that's quite important. Understanding, you know, investing cash in a retail fund versus investing cash normally oh, yeah. versus buying a property. Uh, 
Uh, but also more importantly, why use the borrowing in the first place? Why don't just, you know, go it out in, with, with cash? I mean, yeah. And so one of the most important thing to consider is the leverage of the debt that amplifies the potentials of, you know, you buying an investment property and putting your investment property on steroids, uh, using the debt to your advantage. Uh, and so let's talk about three scenarios that I always tend to talk about in my, I've done this in my one of my one-on-one -on -one lives that, that I did a while back, but let's talk about three scenarios that really talk to me. And uh, in these three scenarios, let's assume that, you know, you have $100,000 uh, to invest. Uh, you can acquire a property that can generate, say, $1,000 per month in rent. Uh, it would cost you, say, $250 per month to hold these properties. Uh, with general hold, not the mortgage, like, you know, um, water Other rates, council rates, yeah. etc. Yeah. yeah. And so for the simplicity's sake, you know, let's call out these, you know, assumptions high level and let's look at three scenarios. Okay. So the first scenario that we are going to talk about is buying a property for cash. Mm. The second scenario that we are going to talk about is buying the property using the debt. Um, and the third scenario that we are going to talk about is basically investing in a retail fund. Okay. And so those are the three key scenarios. And what we are going to look at is, is cash on cash returns. Now, a lot of people get this wrong because they are more focused on the overall growth of the property portfolio. And that's what they are comparing. I always say to people that the cash on cash returns should be your minimalistic benchmark when you are assessing what you're getting on an annual basis. Okay. And so let's look at the first scenario. You're buying a property on cash for say $100,000, mm -hmm. yeah? And so you go out there, you know, you buy a property for cash at 100,000, you generate $1,000 per month in rent, 250 holding costs, you're netting off at say 750 per month, your cash on cash return basically comes down to somewhere around 9% okay. Okay, every year. Great, you know, in a normal case, you know, if you look at it individually, seems quite sort of good number to, to work with, right? All of a sudden, if you start introducing debt to the same scenario, now what you're doing is you're using debt to your advantage. And so the cost of the property doesn't change, but let's assume that you're paying 20% down payment to a mortgage. And so you're mm. only using a portion of your cash, which is say 20K, and you mm. have a mortgage of say 80K against it. And typically a mortgage would cost say 5%. And so you're paying an extra 250 on top of this. And so you combine all the expenses and you take it out of the rent and now your cash return becomes quite significantly lower, okay, in the, in the absolute sense because you're only making $320 per month. But what you need to understand is you've only put yes. up front as $20,000. Yeah. You didn't use the $100,000, right? Yeah. And so if you look at the cash on cash scenario, you're almost cashing up to 20% per annum, which is amazing because what you've done now by using the power of debt or leverage is that you've doubled your return quite significantly, right? So what happens with the rest of the cash then? You can use for other properties maybe, I guess, yeah? 100%, and yeah. that's the power of acquiring multiple properties, right? And so, you know, the beauties of using debt to your advantage is that, you know, you don't stop at one, you know, you can use a portion of the that's cash true. in a much more effective manner and you can go back and double dip and buy the mm. second property and then buy the third property and then if you combine all of them together, instead of you generating, say, 10% cash on your $100,000 or 9% cash on your $100,000, all of a sudden, you are generating 40% cash on cash returns by using debt because you have now two properties, for example, or three properties or four properties uh, as you're building up your, your, your you know, portfolio, portfolio within super innovation as well. But you can do that outside the super as well same same thing, 100% yeah? yeah 100% we have 100%. to be very careful with regards to the diversification and self and super fund you can't every every investment strategy has to be different of course you need to be very careful if you want to invest all in property within the self and super fund as well okay definitely so you invest 100%. a little bit there a little bit there yeah you, you have to make your own investment strategy and make decisions on that basis yes it is it is possible though that is, that, that's it's if it works for you definitely why not you you can nobody's gonna stop you but because it is a highly regulated environment you have to make sure that there's some diversification as well definitely yeah. and so when you talk about this you would see that a lot of people basically go down the route of investing into commercial properties when you mm. when it comes to super and so you would see a lot of people investing into commercial properties 
purely from that sort of reason, because they don't like residential. They think that residential is a bit too much risky, with too much hands-on uh, problems, you know, because you might catch growth, you might not catch growth. Commercial properties are a tad a bit easier because the, the valuation is dependent on the income that you're going to generate out of the property, you know, based on the cap rates, et cetera, all of that. And so, you know, although you might sacrifice a bit of growth, you would get higher cash flow, you would get long-term tenancies, and you can use still that power of debt to basically build your portfolio quite significantly, quite quickly in the commercial. And so what people tend to do is they tend to mix and match. They will use commercial, they use retail, they'll use um, you know, equities, shares, et cetera, and combine all of that together into some of these things. I know one of your clients, Sohel, mm-hmm. um, went a bit sort of crazy and used SMSF uh, towards crypto and that sort of stuff. <laughs> you know? It's right. Yeah, that, that was um, when, when everybody was, investing in cryptos lots of people got crazy and they started using their super money to invest in cryptos as well some of the clients they made money as well in in cryptos but yeah it's a very highly risk investment so yeah people did make money there but they lost money there too um with regards to commercial i i there's an interesting thing with that with with the commercial properties as you know when you buy residential property, you cannot rent it out to your relatives in, in a residential properties or you cannot live in that property. In SMSF. In, yeah. In S- but with the commercial property, there is some flexibility that if you buy a commercial property y- using your self-managed super fund money, then you can lease that commercial property to your own business for own benefit. So it's a win-win situation in commercial property sense. Okay. Your business is making money and your super fund making that money from your own business as well at the same time. So Definitely. though Definitely. super funds are not allowed to run a business directly, you cannot run a business. You cannot do um, a property development business kind of thing, for example, in, in self yes. super fund. But it, yeah. it makes so much sense though, right? I remember yeah. one of our clients where they were looking for a property in SMSF or they were using SMSF to their own advantage, yeah. they were running a, a business and they were paying close to about $4,000 a month in lease, right? Mm. And so if you can direct that money towards your own Just commercial correct. property, yeah. you know, you have to pay that money regardless anyway. You would rather pay off your own commercial property in SMSF and, and capture the, all of that money into a single place rather than doing it at separate occasions, right? So yeah, it's a, it's a very smart strategy to play with. Mm. Uh, when you're going down the route of commercial properties. What, so we have talked a, a lot of good stuff about SMSF buying, right? Yeah. And so the the grass is not always green. Yeah. And so let's talk about some of those burnt grass. Let's talk about some of the fire things that happens within SMSF. So what are the key things or what are other key considerations that people should yeah. consider yeah, look, when they're buying into SMSF? Yeah, I mean, uh, when you have enough cash or liquidity in self-managed super fund, that's fine. Everything is rosy, rosy. That's good. But when you want to borrow some money, it becomes a little bit complicated uh, because borrowing is not easy within self-managed super fund environment. Usually, you get higher interest rates. You always need to have subject to finance clauses in there. Uh, and if you are buying a property, lots of lenders, they don't like properties in a high-risk area. They just want people uh, in metro areas, the property in metro areas. You can't do any developments as such on the property, though they, there's a possibility, but a, a very restrictive, for example. So, in, uh, yeah, and um, you, as I mentioned to you that you can't run any business from your self but You cannot do any kind of business with, uh, in the self super fund. But yeah, commercial property, maybe there's a chance there. But yeah, there's some restriction in that regard because it is highly regulated and it's your retirement savings. I think it, it is a good thing to do to restrict some there has to be some restriction because otherwise i have seen my clients or not they are not my clients anymore because they've been using their self managed super fund as their normal bank account normal business bank account it's, it's it's not your normal bank account because if you have the control over your smsf money it is tempting to use that money for your personal use sometimes okay Definitely. so it is yeah you have to be very careful that's that's that sometimes it's a drawback but there are very severe penalties attached to it. If you do that, if you breach some laws, there are severe penalties um, and there are some criminal penalties that were included in the jail time. So you have, yes. you have to be very careful. And, and people tend to do that, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, they use that SMSF for their own cash flow purposes, right? And so even if it's for a day, the money goes out for your own personal reasons. That's a big, big, big no-no. no. So 
you know, just because you have access to it doesn't mean that you can use it. That's and true. of course, you're seeing better compliances coming through, you know, more restrictions coming through ASIC, really, you know, diving down into a lot of SMSF auditors, a lot of, a lot of SMSF um, uh, planners uh, where, you know, they are trying to tighten a, a lot of these things. It is a big industry. It is a massive industry. Uh, but it's important to talk to the right people when yeah. you're talking about mortgage brokers. Not every mortgage broker can it's do SMSF <laughs> loans. It's a big sort of myth that people think that just because it's a mortgage broker, they should be able to do SMSF loans. They're very, very tricky, especially with the subject to finance clause and the bear trust that needs to be created after mm. the property has been bought, not before the property has been bought. So there's a lot of these things that needs to be considered when you are going through some of this. And of course, speak to your accountant, speak to your property advisor, make sure that you're not taking any gamble in, in investing when you're buying something in SMSF. Yeah, it's your nest egg. You don't want to gamble your nest egg, basically, isn't it? Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Any parting words before we close off for our audience? Like, like what we discussed, that it is uh, you need to uh, go to your professional. Uh, you get the professional advice from your uh, your professional accountants, financial advisor, or property advisor. It is de- definitely a better outcome in if you compare it with the retail super funds. If they are earning six, seven percent there. You can get a little bit more from self managed super fund if you invest with the correct advice. So yeah, perfect. So that is where we are going to end. Ensure that you are using correct advice when you are mm-hmm. investing with self managed super funds. It is a strong vehicle to play with, but it is also very compliance focused. Yeah. Thank you for listening to us today. Have a wonderful day. This is Moss checking out. Keep smiling. Keep safe. Keep investing. This is Adios from Help Me Buy Property Podcast. See ya.